as you've heard in the introduction, I've had what you may call a three-way career. I've had jobs in government and business and NPOs. And while I've had jobs in different sectors, one thing in common has been that in each case, I've had the opportunity to spend time in Japan. And so I've spoken around Japan before as an NPO person who was talking about fundraising and as a corporate person talking about corporate social responsibility. And today I have the opportunity to talk to you about what happens when you bring it all together. And, and this topic is about partnerships. Now the, the presentation today may seem a little basic for some of you. Uh, judging from the background, some of you are probably more expert on this topic than I am. But as I've been talking around Japan, you know, I find a different level of awareness of partnerships uh, across the audience. So please bear with me while I sort of start from the beginning and we work our way through this topic. I look forward to the discussion very much today. Sometimes this topic is called public-private partnerships or PPPs or alliances or multi-sector collaboration. Public-private partnership is probably the oldest term, but PPP is usually understood to be a partnership that's between government and business only. It's usually an alternative form of public financing, and it's largely about you know, infrastructure or service delivery. And it seldom has to do with uh, NPOs. What I want to talk about today is a different kind of public-private partnership, and that is those which involve government, business, and NPOs. And for uh, purposes of a title, I will call them tri-sector partnerships. So who are the parties in these partnerships? Well, broadly speaking, it's government, NPO, and corporations. These partnerships can take place at any level, local, national, regional, international. They can be very formal, or they can be very informal. They can be centrally managed, or they can be managed sort of in parallel between the different parties. Regardless of how they're put together, the partnerships are usually represented by the three circles, and usually three overlapping circles. Now, in a strong partnership, all the circles are equal. And this doesn't mean that everybody brings the same amount of money to the discussion, or the same number of staff. Uh, in fact, what makes each partner uh, important in the partnership is that they bring different things. It's the diversity of inputs that's important. What makes the partnership equal, however, what makes, what makes the circles equal is defined by respect. That is that everyone brings something different to the table, but each other respects the other partners equally. So one might bring money, one might bring technical assistance, and one might bring to the community networks. They're all very different inputs, but they're equally respected inputs. Before we get into too many details of what we're going to talk about, let me answer a key question. And that is, why should I learn about these partnerships? I mean, isn't it just easier for the government to provide its services or for the corporations to create its products, for NPOs to have their passions, without having to share this with the other sectors? Well, it was a government official in the UK who had, a, I think, a very clear answer to the question of why partner. She said the main reason to think about partnerships now is that the world is a very complicated place and with very complicated issues that requires sophisticated responses. And that in developing the responses, all the parties have a contribution to make. And no one party has all the answers. In the United States, we have a phrase which is, two heads are better than one. In Japan, I think you have a better phrase, sanin yoreba monju no chie. And I think that's the easiest answer to the question of why partner. Now, three heads may be better than one, but 
Specifically, why do organizations enter into these partnerships? I mean, they are a lot of work. Well, I think the, the simplest answer is because they see a benefit. They see a self-interest in partnering, and that's fine. This is also the hardest part of creating a partnership, is understanding that everybody's self-interest is a positive thing. Partnering is about making the overlap of those interests work together more powerfully than having them <coughs> work than they do on their own. And that power can be seen in a variety of different factors. For instance, in increasing resources, in increasing legitimacy, access, results, in enhancing sustainability by sharing the responsibility for the issue that you're working on, and in expanding the scope by sharing the opportunity to work on this together. Uh, I'm going to take a couple of examples to sort of show you more what I'm talking about. And I've got quite a few we can talk about, but we'll just pick two today. I'll pick one from the ODA field, and another one then domestically in Japan. Here's an example of an uh, ODA example, in this case in Vietnam. The, there were several technology companies that had basically charitable CSR programs to help bring IT skills to communities in Vietnam that did not have opportunity otherwise. And each company was going to start from the very beginning and build one or two centers in a year. But you were never going to reach 85 million Vietnamese going one or two little community centers at a time. At the same time, the government of Vietnam wanted a much more rapid increase in these skills. And the, uh, there was an NPO in Vietnam CR called CRC, which also wanted to, as its mission, expand learning, lifelong learning, outside of schools and universities. So by working together and joined by USAID, the US ODA agency, instead of being able to open a few centers, these groups put together and they opened 64 centers in two years, one in each province of the country. And they did this by not only combining their cash, but also the expertise and the personal net networks and other elements of mutually beneficial influence. So you had uh, companies in there with their self-interest of demonstrating their products or creating market entry. You had the government with its self-interest of getting support for financing community education. And you had the NPO with its self-interest of achieving its personal mission. And by working together, they were able to create something that was much bigger in, in a partnership than if they had continued to work alone. Now, when I went looking for an uh, example of a Japanese example of a tri-sector partnership, I thought it was going to be kind of hard, given the state of the NPO community in Japan, relatively small size of NPOs here. And it's, it's not easy to find a good tri-sector partnership. But here's an example, an emerging example in the area of healthcare. When the National Cancer Act was enacted in 2007, cancer control committees were created at the national level and also at the prefectural level. This ended up being a catalyzing event for bringing together patient groups, governments, and the medical industry, particularly the, the pharmaceutical industry. Now, the civil society organizations of this example, so the patient organizations, they're very diffuse. Most of them are not even registered as NPOs. So there's no exact count, but there's estimated to be over 1,500 of these groups in Japan. Most of them are very local, and few of them had actually networked with each other. And individually, they were not that powerful. However, another NPO, the Health Policy Institute of Japan, has been working to bring not only all those groups together, those patient groups, but also the government and the business to work in partnership on some common goals. 